Let's do a, a quick review of complexity concepts and kind of simplify things down a little bit. Um, so one of my main goals here is to show you ways to do complexity estimates and to prepare you for practical, critical thinking about computation. And we'll put this into practice with some of the examples we've already seen in this class. So as kind of an overview of what I'm going to cover right now, I'm going to talk about uh, review the concept of time and dropping constants and just give you a, an easy way to kind of measure when you can do that and when you can't. Uh, we'll look at some big concepts, a quick review of the basic ideas of upper and lower bounds, big O and big omega. Uh, and then we'll look at patterns that actually come up in code. So we'll look at sequential things, we will look at loops, we will look at mutually exclusive actions, and we'll look at uh, abstractions. Between this group of four different concepts, you can use slightly different approaches to uh, come up with estimates of complexity that will work for uh, a pretty large number of real world cases. And oftentimes you can come up with a quick estimate of upper and lower bounds that are reasonably accurate and much easier to determine than using things like uh, uh, limits. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the idea of time and dropping constant. So just to review, um, actual time depends on a specific computer and processor. Um, so we've been thinking about operation counts as a proxy for time, but really the key here is we, we just do not know the unit of measure of time. Okay, um, So uh, when can we ignore the coefficients? The basic idea of when we can ignore coefficients is if we uh, could merely change units to make the coefficients go away. So let's look at uh, an example of what I mean by that. So. Uh, Consider a, a, an ever to be a unit of time. Uh, so I took this from my, my surname. I tried several other uh, funny made up words and almost all of them had a meaning somewhere. So I apologize if this has some, some meaning somewhere that doesn't seem to fit here, but it's based on my name. Uh, so an ever is a, a unit of time. Maybe it's one second. Maybe it's something, some, some, something uh, much less time than one second. Assume an operation takes one ever. Um, and then maybe, maybe two operations take two evers. Um, so we could consider uh, a Revy to be two Ever. So it's a, it's a different unit of time that represents twice as much time as a single Ever. We could reflect back on our same two operations and just recast them by simply changing the unit. Two operations, I could take two Evers or it could take one Revy. Okay? So this is an example where merely changing the unit um, gives us a different way to express something that, that's roughly equivalent. So this doesn't work if we were taking two operations that were vastly different orders of magnitude. If I were comparing something that were uh, 100 evers to something that was 1 ever. So what we're really worried about is when things are vastly different orders of magnitude or, or really different orders of growth. Okay? Um, if things are, are roughly comparable, where just switching the units would allow us to combine them together, uh, then we can kind of ignore the, the constant coefficients on them. Okay, so um, imagine an algorithm takes two evers. I could say it's an equivalent, uh, two n evers. I could say it's equivalent to an algorithm that takes n revy, because remember, two evers is one revy. Okay, okay, so summary here, the big picture. When using the big O concepts for time, we can drop constants and assume that they are folded into the idea of the units. We could, if the um, the constants kind of represent just using a, a different uh, unit. Okay. okay, back to the idea of lower and upper bounds. So our goal here is to come up with a quick and accurate ac estimate for big O and big omega. And it's also to check our work. If you're using limit tests to demonstrate something, it'd be nice before you get to the point of using the limit test if you already have a good feel for what you'd expect out of it. Uh, if things check out, that's great. If not, you should double check your work, both on, on producing your estimate and on, on your work with limits. Okay, so remember that uh, we're oftentimes looking for an upper bound, a big O. We wanna know what's the worst case we could expect for how long something's gonna take. Because oftentimes we just wanna know, is this worth waiting for or should I find some alternate method of doing something? So upper bounds are about a maximum. It's the time needed for the worst case. Uh, we're also sometimes interested in a lower bound, the big omega. What's the minimum amount of time or the best case? So really the, the key points there are the concept of maximum and minimum. And we'll come back to that in just a little bit. So now let's talk about patterns we see in code. 
One of the patterns we see in code is the, the concept of sequential things. So basic principle, time and sequential actions adds. So what do I mean by that? Let's look at an everyday example. I'm going to read for two hours, and then I'm going to exercise for one hour. Total amount of time, three hours. I did a sequence of two things. The amount of time total is just adding up each of those individual things, okay? Same pattern holds true in code. So we've got an example where I'm doing one operation and then doing another operation. The total amount of time is just the sum of time for the first operation plus the, the time for the second operation. Okay. So let's talk about loops too. So loops multiply the time or the, the work being done in the loop. So a simple example, I'm going to take 10 two-hour naps. Total amount of time spent napping, 20 hours. That's an awful lot of napping. Um, okay, also keep in mind that in the big O, we don't care about constants. If I was going to use a constant like 10 in code, um, that would be something that basically I would justify as being constant time. It's one of those cases where I can kind of argue, you know, if our, our units of time were different, it would be doing a fixed amount of work. It's always going to take the same amount of time. Uh, so generally in code, when we're, we're looking at loops, we're really looking about loops that are based on some unknown variable like n, where there's some parameter that's impacting the runtime. Okay, so again, loops multiply. So let's look at an example in code. I've got a loop that's going to count from uh, 0 to n, and it's going to uh, continuously call one method. Total amount of time is n times the time for that method. Okay, what about nested loops? So nested loops also multiply. And if we wanted to be a little bit lazy, uh, because we know constants eventually get eliminated, sometimes we can do some things that are a little bit pessimistic. This might give us a, a big O estimate that's a little bit too high, higher than it needs to be. Um, but it's a starting point. So as an example, imagine we've got a loop that counts from 0 to n, and then an inner loop that starts at i and counts as long as we're less than n. So uh, note that the inner loop, again, does not start at 0. So we've already done some analysis of things like this, and, and we've seen how this ends up being an n squared loop, and this is related to the, um, the formula, that, the summation formula that uh, Gauss gets credit for. Um, n times n plus 1 over 2. Um, but for our purposes here, we could actually just be pessimistic and we could just assume that this inner loop, it's, it's always going to be less than uh, n units of time, roughly. Uh, and we could be pessimistic and just assume that it's n. Okay? So what we could assume is that the total amount of work here is the time in the outer loop, the n, times the time in the inner loop, another n, uh, times the work that's actually being done in another method. Okay, that gives us at least a rough draft of the complexity, and we're looking for an upper bound. It's definitely better than this, right? Okay, so let's move on and look at um, mutually exclusive actions. So by mutually exclusive actions, I mean when we've got a menu of several different things that could happen, but only one of them happens. Okay, so uh, if we're just focusing on big O, it's the worst of the possible actions time. If we're focusing on big omega, it's the best. So again, back to this idea of max and min that I mentioned earlier. So an example, again, an everyday example, I'm either going to spend eight hours preparing a lecture or one hour eating lunch. I'm going to do one of those two things, but not both. Okay. Um, you don't necessarily know how much time I'm actually going to invest, but you have both a maximum, I'm going to spend no more than eight hours, or a minimum, I'm going to spend at least an hour, no matter which path I go in. So this, this is, again, we're talking about mutually exclusive options, where I do one thing or the other, but not both. So again, let's look at this principle in code. So if we're looking at mutually exclusive actions, we're worried about either the worst case, the big O is the maximum, or the best case, the omega is the minimum. So an example in code, imagine that we've got an if-else statement. So this is an if, else, if, else. So in this case, there are three mutually exclusive options, and it's really important that they're nested in this way. Uh, if they weren't nested in this particular way, I may have to think about this problem differently. So if I want to know what the 
Worst case time is, it's going to do one of these three options, but only one of them. It's the maximum of the time either taken by uh, one method, the method named one method, or the time taken by the method called another method, or the time taken by the method called yet another method. Um, big omega would just be the minimum of these three. It's going to do one of these three. It's uh, the minimum of them is the best I could expect out of this. Okay, our third code concept is abstractions, which we've already been using even in this just short discussion. The basic idea is that abstractions are replaced by their own internal maximum or minimum values. So as an example, um, an everyday example, I'm going to do my laundry. Um, doing laundry takes between one and four hours. So the, the abstraction is just this general concept, doing my laundry. We'll look at the coding concept here in just a second. But uh, based on some pre-known information about this, a minimum and maximum, we will use those as we're trying to determine either the big O, which would be the worst case, the maximum, or the big omega, the best case, the minimum. Okay, so let's look at this in terms of code. Okay, so now let's talk about abstractions. So uh, again, the principle is that abstractions are replaced by their own internal maximum or minimum. So let's look at an example with code. So imagine I've got some unknown method and it gets passed some sort of parameter. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just a simple integer. Maybe it's some sort of an array. Um, and I've already gone through and analyzed that particular method and I've identified both what its best case is and what its worst case is. Uh, so then I just utilize those as the uh, best and worst case. So if I'm trying to figure out the worst case, I use the worst case of the method itself. If I'm trying to figure out the best case, I use the best case of the method itself. Okay, so with that, we've got, kind of got some principles we can use to analyze existing pseudocode or algorithms and quickly come up with an estimate for big O and big omega. So let's go ahead and apply that.